Hey, well, good morning. I wanted to see if you guys are awake. Everybody awake this morning? It's so good to see you. There we go. Hey, hey, we're, we're so glad that you're here, whether you're here in person, you're watching this online. We're especially glad uh, that you're watching this online. Um, hey, in case you haven't been with us, we've been in this series. We're in the middle of this series called Family. And, and the goal is really discovering the steps that each of us need to take to help our families move forward uh, to a healthier place. We're not trying to be perfect. We're not trying to uh, have no stress in our families, right? Because that's impossible. What we're trying to do is is get each and every one of our families to a healthier place. Like, we want to be the best family we can be. More importantly, we want to be the best that we can be for our families. Now, as I've been saying in this series, I fully recognize that one size doesn't fit all. Meaning the dynamics of my family is very different than the dynamics of your family. And, and we're all over the place when it comes to who and how our family operates right now in life. Some of us are, are married and we have kids living under the same roof. Some of us are in a blended family. Some of us are single. Some of us are divorced. Some of us are widowed. Some of us are, are taking care of and stressing out about aging parents. Some of us are really close to our families. Others of us, not so much. Some of us interact with our families each and every day. Some of us only interact with our families once or twice a year, right? Around the holidays, if that. So I fully recognize that that one size doesn't fit all when we're talking about our families. Um, But what we all have in common is that like when we hear the word family, an image pops up. It's what we've been saying in this series, that, that when I say family, when you hear the word family, there is an image that pops up in your head, whether that be a group of people you have. Okay, this is my family, or maybe it's just one person or, or two people in your life, but that is my family, for better or for worse. And let's face it, sometimes it's for the worse, right? Uh, I, I think we can all acknowledge that. In fact, I brought some pictures of some family pictures that went horribly wrong. Uh, here's the first one, okay? Here we go. Here's that. We like, like some of you guys can relate to that. Not only you, literally that was your family growing up uh, or when you had kids, but that like represents your family today, right? Some of us. Uh, here's another one that went, uh, I, I don't know what to say with this one. Uh, that, that was not uh, my family in the 70s, okay? But, but uh, uh, just uh, let's go to the next one because I can't even really say anything about that. Uh, here's another one. Uh, just again, uh, that maybe, maybe you resonate with that. That's my family. Uh, here's, here's another one uh, that's beautiful. Uh, I, I love it. You know, not again. You know, I mean, some of you guys, that's your experience. Like, oh, drama in the family again, not again here. Uh, here's another one. Uh, isn't that how sometimes our family, we think we have it all together and then uh, everybody goes their own way and we're, we're out of sync with each other. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this may be my favorite. I, I, the word love, right? A, a beautiful word. And no one seems to really enjoy that word love in this family. Uh, but my main guess is, is that many of you guys, as you look at these, these pictures, you're like, you know what, Steve? That's my experience with my family right now. I, I, I just want to break down and cry or, or, you know, love. Are you kidding me? There's no love in my family right now. Like some of you guys are like, yeah, that's my family. Now, whatever your image is of your family right now, that is the context by which we're doing this series. That's the context for you today and next week as we conclude this series called Family. Now, uh, you may not realize this or not, and here's something really interesting about families, and it's true of every family, my family, your family. Every family has a heartbeat. I don't know if you ever thought about it, but every family, my family, your family, has a heartbeat. And the family works best, the, the, the family functions best when it's one single, unified heartbeat. When the whole family is moving in the same direction, when the whole family has the same values, same priorities, same purpose. Now, for a lot of us, that's wishful thinking. Because oftentimes in families, what happens is that single heartbeat that God had designed for our families begins to get out of sync. And one person begins to go this way. 
And, and another person goes that way. And then one person says, well, this is, it, this is what's more important to me in life. And then another person, another person. And before you know it, the heartbeat of our family is out of sync with one another. And all the issues and all the conflict and all the problems really begin to take its toll when we're not beating after the same things. That's just true of life. That's true of our families. It's like our physical hearts, if you think about it. Our physical hearts have a certain beat that we need to be, that's expected of our hearts, that considers our hearts healthy. Uh, I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on TV, but I I hear medical reports, and uh, there is something that they call uh, when your heart isn't operating the way it needs to, to, to operate when it's beating too fast or when it's beating too slow or when it's abnormal, it's called a, an arrhythmia. You guys have probably heard of that word, an arrhythmia. It's when your heart isn't beating like it should. And I often think that that's what happens to our families. Although the goal is for us to be one single heartbeat, oftentimes what I, it's what I call a family arrhythmia where everyone's going their own directions. Uh, In your marriage, if you're married, uh, it's when your heartbeat isn't beating after the same things as your spouse. And don't be surprised when there's troubles that come your way in your marriage. It's when the heartbeat of a parent isn't in sync with the heartbeat of a child and there's chaos and conflict. When the heart of the in-law isn't in sync or beats differently than the heart of a grandparent, then there's tension. I think we can all relate to that. And the goal for each and every one of our families is for us to get to a place where we talk about the heart and, and where we are beating after the same things. Now, that's not easy. Just be upfront today. That is not an easy thing for us. It's going to take a lot of work. But I do think it's possible. No matter what your family situation is, I do think it's possible. And it starts with recognizing that where the focus of our attention needs to be. See, here's what I believe. I think we need to be more concerned about the condition of our heart's family than the disappointment of our family's actions. We need to be more concerned about the condition of our family's heart than the disappointment that comes from our family actions. See, because here's what happens is, is, is something will happen. Somebody will do something in our family and we'll get upset, we'll be disappointed, we'll be sad, we'll be mad, we'll be jealous, we'll be angry, whatever it is, and we'll focus on the behavior. We'll focus on the what of the family. And instead, what we need to be doing is focusing on the why. We need to be more concerned about why my spouse always does this or always says this. We need to be more concerned about why the child is rebelling instead of just what they are doing. See, we need to flip it. Instead of focusing on the what of my family, I need to focus on the why of my family. And when you do that, when you begin to talk about the why, when you begin to dig deep into the heart of the matter that's going on in your family progress will be made. When you just focus on the what of your family, all you're focusing on is is something that you can only put a Band-Aid on, right? When you're focusing on why your spouse is, or focusing on what your spouse is doing instead of why, you're just trying to put a Band-Aid on it. At best, it's a temporary fix. So we need to deal with the heart today. Now, we talk about the heart a lot around here at Journey Church, and there's a good reason why, is because Jesus talked a lot about the heart. See, with Jesus, the heart, it was all about the heart. In fact, with Jesus, uh, he was more focused on people's hearts than he was their actions. For example, there's this one time where uh, one of his disciples comes and he says, hey, uh, you you told a story earlier. We we call them in the Bible parables. You told a story earlier about um, what, like how you eat and what you eat doesn't necessarily defile you. I'll, I'll just read it for you. Matthew chapter 15, verse 15 says this. Then Peter said to Jesus, 
explain to us the parable or the story that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. Because if this is true, this is revolutionary, Peter says. Peter, Peter says, listen, if this is true, that, that people aren't defiled by what they eat or how they eat it, I mean, this is big. So you have to understand that in Jesus' day, the Jewish religion, they had very specific dietary restrictions. For example, one of them was before you were to eat anything, you had to go through a cleansing ceremony. You had to wash your hands, but not just wash your hands like your mom or your dad when you were growing up said, hey, go wash your hands before dinner, right? I'm not talking about that. We're not even talking about, like, remember last year during COVID, we, we all got instructions on how to properly wash our hands and count to, what was it, 20 or something like that? Like, I, no, I'm talking more than that. Whenever you sat down for a meal, you had to go through a ceremony to clean yourself, like head to toe. It was major. And guess what? If you did not... And someone saw you not going through this ceremony, you were labeled as unclean or unholy. Uh, if you were to go to the city market, now this was before the days of refrigeration and, and, and freezing and they couldn't keep food. So you went to the city market every day because you had to eat stuff that was fresh. And if you went to the city market, you were a good religious Jew and you picked up an apple, you picked up a tomato, you couldn't just bite into it. You had to go home and go through the same ceremony, not only with your hands, but also with the food. If you didn't, you were labeled unholy, unclean, sinner. Uh, Meat. Let's talk about meat for a second. In the Jewish days of Jesus' day, uh, the religion taught that you couldn't eat meat that had been sacrificed to an idol which is very common in those days. They would take meat and they would put it on an open fire and, and, and within a, a pagan temple and they would sacrifice it to some god, some false idol. And the Jewish religion says, uh-uh, not gonna work. We only serve one God. And I don't care how good a prime meat that was. I don't care how well it was cooked. It, you could not eat it because it was sacrificed to idols. If you did, guess what? You were considered unholy, unclean, sinner. Just by what you ate. Uh, you couldn't eat pork. Guys, that means no bacon, right? That, that, that's a miserable life without bacon. Imagine life without bacon. It was because pigs were considered unclean. Of course they were. Have you ever seen a pig? They're very, very dirty. But if you were found eating pork as a Jew, you were regarded as a sinner, unholy. Here's, here, here's the point. Um, the religion of that day, of Peter's day, of Jesus' day, they taught, hey, it matters what you eat and how you eat it. And if you don't eat the right things, if you don't eat it the right way, guess what? You are a sinner. You are unrighteous. You are unholy. Your spirituality, part of it was based on how you ate and what you ate. Now, Jesus comes onto the scene, and he rocks the religious boat more than anyone before him. He, you see, he begins to teach, hey, it really doesn't matter. Like what you eat or how you eat will not determine your spirituality. Mind blown. Crazy talk. Uh, listen to how Jesus responds because Peter says, hey, is this true? Because if, if, if so, this, this changes everything. Now, Jesus almost sounds a little frustrated because he's already made it clear to them. He says, don't you understand yet? Jesus asked, anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. We, we all get that, right? We, we understand what Jesus is meaning by that. It's just food. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart comes evil thoughts and murder and adultery and all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you, Jesus says. Here's the point that Jesus is trying to make. Don't worry so much about the externals of life corrupting you. Instead, worry about the internal influences of the heart because that is ultimately what's going to corrupt you. You see, Jesus understood more than most that all behavior flows from the heart. You get that? Every word you speak, every decision that I make, 
Every act that you pursue in life, the Bible says, flows from the heart. It's where it starts. And that's why Jesus, while he lived here on planet Earth, was way more focused on people's hearts than people's behavior, people's actions. See, contrary to popular belief, Jesus didn't come to change our behavior. Many of us believe that's why Jesus came. If I follow Jesus, the more I'm in love with Jesus, the more I live for Jesus, then it's all about sin management. He's going to give me the power to manage my sin. But that's not how Jesus works. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to change your behavior. He didn't come to change my behavior. He came to change our hearts. Why? Because Jesus knows that when your heart is right, it will take care of everything else. All behavior flows from the heart. And we see that this is so true, especially when it comes to our families. I mean, have you ever tried to change a family member? You know how hard that is? Like some of you have been fighting for years to change your spouse and they still won't change. Some of you have have been hitting your head against the wall about trying to change your child and they're an adult now. They're in their 50s and it's still not working. Some of you guys, you, you have been fighting and there's this tension in your life trying to change the behavior of your adult mom and dad or your adult brother or sister. And it's insanity, right? Trying to change someone. It's insanity because it doesn't work. You don't have the power and I don't have the power to change anyone. And so if Jesus was here this morning, I believe he would stand up here and say, hey, whatever your family situation is, stop trying to change their behavior and deal with the heart. Let's talk about the why instead of the what. Jesus would say, listen, stop responding to the behavior that you don't like and start reviewing the heart. See, because with Jesus, it's all about the heart. With God, it's all about the heart. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. One of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible is Uh, In the Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Solomon, the wisest man who's ever lived, said these words, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. He says, guard your heart above all else. Now that word guard, it's an interesting word because it literally means to keep watch. It's the image of a watchman who's standing at the entrance or the doorway of a home. And that watchman's goal is to keep watch so that nothing harmful, so no criminals, no thieves come in and enter into the family and harm the family and the home. That's the image. Guard your heart above all else. Keep watch. Make sure nothing corrupt gets in. When I hear this word guard I, uh, and, and the translation of it, I think I, I go back to my visit to England about 20 years ago. Uh, there's this thing called the Queen's Guard. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, uh, but it's a real thing in England, and it's a part of the military of England. And the Queen's Guard, as to be expected by its name, their goal, their specific focus and role within the military is to keep watch, to guard all the royal family's homes throughout the country, all the palaces. And the Queen's Guard is, is, is infamously known, mainly in London, uh, guarding Buckingham Palace. And you probably have seen pictures of this, of the guards, the Queen's Guard. And they're, they're in this uh, sophisticated uniform. And they, every two hours, they have a changing of the guards. And it's, it's a lot of pageantry and pomp and circumstance. Uh, but it's interesting. I, I've really learned a lot about the Queen's Guard. And, and one of the things they do is uh, they, they go on two-hour shifts. 
So every Queen's Guards person has a two-hour shift. And during those two hours, there are high expectations of them. They do not lose focus. They cannot, uh, they always have to be on their guard the whole time. They cannot take it easy, even for 30 seconds. Their focus is making sure that nothing harmful enters into the gates of the royal palace. And they have this protocol. And if there is a threat, the protocol is, first and foremost, the Queen's Guard, when there is a threat, the first thing they will do is they will make a stomp with their boots. And if you've ever been around them, it's, it's loud. It gets your attention. Now, if this doesn't prevent the the, the threat from going further and the threat is still there, the next thing they will do is as loud and, and, and with authority as much as they can, they will bellow out, move away from the queen's guard. As calm but as loud as possible, move away from the queen's guard. That means you better leave. You're in my space. Now, the third thing that they do, the protocol for Queen's Guard, is if that still doesn't work, they are to get their gun ready. They are to be ready to go and to shoot if they need to be. And during their two-hour watch, they are not to be distracted at all. They are to look straight ahead unless there is a threat, and then they go through that protocol. Now, you probably have heard uh, when I was there, uh, I I wanted to test it out. You probably have heard that uh, tourists will come up to them and they will get in their face and they will like, they will snap at them and they will like go like this and see if they blink. They will yell at them. Some stupid tortoise, you know, will do that. I didn't do that. But some of the people with me did that, you know, and they would go up and they would go up to these Queens guards to see if they could get them off focus. And in my mind, I'm like, I hope that Queens guard just knocks them out, right? Like you want to see that sometime, but they are just so straight faced, so focused. All they're worried about is protecting the royal palace. That, my friends, is the image that Solomon gives here in Proverbs. Guard your heart above all else. Now, when he says this, that doesn't mean that you put up a sign above your heart that says, keep out. Because that's what we do sometimes, especially with family. Because there are family members who have hurt us, They've disappointed us. They've betrayed us. They've let us down. And so what we do by default as human beings is we begin to put this barbed wire around our hearts. And we're like, you want back in? Uh Uh-uh. You're not coming back in. You hurt me. You betrayed me. You're not coming back into my heart. You were in my heart once, but not again. We often find ourselves in that situation with our family because of hurt and pain. Now, what Solomon is saying when he says, guard your heart, he's saying, make sure that there is nothing corrupt from the outside, from the broken, evil world that we live in. Make sure that nothing corrupt comes from the outside into your heart. Make sure, above all else, make it your top priority. Which brings us to the action point for you and for me today as it relates to our farm, fi- families. And I can't say it any better than Solomon said it. Here's the action step. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Make it a top priority for you in your life. Because while you may not be responsible for the hearts of any of your family members, you are 100% responsible for your heart. Guard your heart. Because what's going in in your heart, you can set the pace for your family. You can set the pace of love and goodness and forgiveness and grace. Or on the flip side, if your heart's all messed up and filled with junk and and corruption, it, it can set the pace for your family of anger and bitterness and resentment and pain and negativity. Guard your heart. For those of us who are married here, guard your heart in your marriage. Do whatever you need to do to make sure that nothing gets into your heart that is going to hurt your marriage. If your parents here today, guard your heart 
so that nothing gets in that will sabotage the decisions you make for your children. Guard your heart. Guard your heart so that when there is a conflict with your adult brother or sister or your aunt, your uncle, or your in-laws, that, that the toxic words will stay at bay, will not allow to be entered into your heart. Guard your heart above all else, Solomon says, because it will determine the direction of your life. It will determine the direction of your family. Now, there are three words or three questions that I think is going to help us understand what, like, how do I guard my heart, Steve? What does that look like? Well, I think there are three questions that we need to ask ourselves routinely, regularly, to make sure that we're protecting our heart as best we can. The first question is, uh, what am I exposing myself to? What, what am I exposing myself to? What am I fixing my eyes on? What am I looking at? See, because the eyes, they're a very powerful thing, the Bible says. If you think you can look at things and watch things with your eyes and it not impact your heart, you're fooling yourself. Make sure that your eyes are looking at the right things. Because here's the thing. Your heart is under attack each and every day. And one of the ways this world attacks our heart is through our eyes, what we see. And that could be the internet. It could be media. It could be pictures. It could be images. What are you exposing yourself to? What are you looking at? Guarding your heart, that's a question you need to ask. Here's the second question is, who am I listening to? Who am I listening to? Now, I'm not talking about your Spotify playlist, okay? I'm talking about something more important than that. Who are you allowing permission to speak into your life? What voices are influencing your heart? Maybe for some of us, it's Facebook. You know, we just scroll and scroll and scroll. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And yeah, that makes me mad. I can't believe this. That, that you're letting all those voices of all those people, Facebook friends, people you don't even know, people you don't know on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and Twitter, all those people that we're on social media all the time. And guess what? We're allowing them to have a voice into our lives. Don't think that that's innocent. That is making a difference. That's impacting your heart. You ever leave away from social media and you're upset, you're angry, you're hurt, you're frustrated? Why? Because you're allowing those voices into your heart. Maybe it's a friend. You love them, but they're negative. And they always seem that they want to fight something or have an agenda about something. Listen, be careful because who you allow to have a voice in your life will impact your heart. Guard your heart from those people. Guard your heart from those voices. Uh, the third question is maybe the most critical one. And it's what am I holding on to? What am I holding on to? Because if we were honest... And our hearts are holding on to a lot, especially when it comes to our families. And for many of us, we don't even realize we're holding on to it. I gave that up years ago, and yet we're still holding on to it in our hearts. Uh, we don't even realize that it's doing damage into our, our hearts until it's too late. It's the silent killer. What are you holding on to in your family? Regret, anger, resentment, hurt, distrust. Don't think that you're not holding on to something. And the more your heart holds on to those things, the more it becomes toxic, not only to your heart, but to your family. Guard your heart above all else because it will determine the course of your life. Ask these questions on a regular basis. 
What am I exposing myself to? What, what am I putting in front of my eyes? I need to be careful about that. You know, who am I listening to? I, I, need to, I need to be stingy when it comes to the voices that are influencing my life. What am I holding on to? There's some things in my life I need to, I need to let go of. I need to just forget about it. You ask yourself these three questions on a regular basis. It's like a regular heart checkup. It's good for your heart because it shows you where you need some work. It shows you what you need to be doing and how to guard your heart. And as you guard your heart, you continue to pray for your family. And I'm not just talking about this 30-day prayer challenge that I've laid out to you guys about for 30 days straight, pray over your family. I hope you're doing that. I'm talking about after the 30 days. As you're guarding your heart, pray. Because prayer is a powerful, powerful thing. When you don't know what to do in your marriage and your marriage is all screwed up and, and you don't know where to turn next, you pray. When you don't know how to handle a rebellious child, you get down on your knees and you pray. When you don't know how to deal with a parent that is aging and and is stubborn, pray. When you don't know how to deal with a family conflict that has just gotten out of control, you get down on your knees. Not really. It sounds good. You do whatever you do, but you pray to the God of the universe. The Apostle Paul understood the power of prayer, especially in family situations when it's tough, when it's difficult. Listen to what he says in Philippians chapter four, starting in verse six. He says, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. It, it, we can't even understand it. His peace, and here, here's the important part. Listen to this. His peace will what? Guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. His, his peace will guard your hearts. See, here's the truth. Peace in your heart always precedes peace in your family. If you really want peace in your family, it starts with your heart. Peace. You can't expect to have peace in your family when there isn't peace in your heart. So if you're sitting there this morning and you don't feel at peace in your heart, guess what? That's going to flow out into your family. On the flip side, you actually can have peace in your heart before you ever experience peace in your family. That's what Paul says here. Hey, hey, there may be chaos in your family right now. There may be confusion and brokenness and messiness all over your family right now. But guess what? With God's help, he can guard your heart and bring peace into your heart, even when there's chaos around you. Peace in your heart always precedes peace in your family. Now, I don't know the specifics of your current family situation. Maybe it's amazing right now. But maybe it's not so great. Maybe it's not so healthy. And I don't know the issues that you're dealing with. I don't know the setbacks, the brokenness, the hurt, the pain, the confusion. But here's what I do know. You and I, we have to deal with the heart first. Stop focusing on the behavior and the actions and what they did and what they didn't do and start focusing on the heart. To be a little bit more specific, start focusing on your heart. Start working on your heart. Guard your heart. Get all the stuff that needs to get out and get to a place where your heart is healthy, where your heart is beating in sync with God's heart. Because once your heart is in a good place, guess what? Now you can begin to encourage and inspire everyone else in your family to sync up and link up with your heartbeat as you follow God. But know this, this is just a warning. 
Just as I said, you can't change a person's behavior or actions, no matter how hard we try. Guess what? You can't change their heart either. You can't change your spouse's heart. You can't change your mom's heart. You can't change your child's heart. Heck, you can't even change your heart. I know we want to. I, I do all the time. Like, I know my heart sometimes is not where it needs to be. And I, I think it's as easy as flipping a switch. Any of you guys like that? It's like, okay, God, today my heart's different. I don't have that power. There is not enough strength in me to change my own heart. And that's true of you too. But the good news is we know someone who does. And that's God. In fact, it's a specialty. The God of the universe, he's an expert at changing hearts. God is the one who changes hearts. Jesus Christ is the one who changes hearts. The Holy Spirit is the one who changes hearts. That's not mine. That's not yours. And the Bible makes this clear from the very beginning of time. And God promises us he says, I want to come in and I want to change your heart. And he gives us this promise for all who would ever follow him. We find this promise in the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. And I want to end with this. This is God's promise for you. And this is God's promise for every member of your family. Listen to this. And he's speaking to his people, which is, we're a part of it. And he says this, and I will give you, what? I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit inside of you. I, I, will, I will take out your, your, your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. That's God's promise to me and to you. God comes to us and he says, I want to give you a new heart. You're struggling with your heart. You've got all this stuff going on. I want to give you a new heart and I have the power to do it. I want to rip out that junk and all the corruption and the, 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 the stony, hard feelings that you are holding inside. I'm going to take all of that out and replace it with a tender heart. That's God's promise. And my prayer is that becomes our prayer. God, change my heart. God, remove all those things that get in the way of me being the best I can be for my family. Replace all that stuff with good stuff. May that be our prayer today, not just for ourselves, but for every member in our family. Because the Bible teaches us from Genesis to Revelation, it's not so much about our behavior and our actions. It's all about the heart. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for being a God who just tells it like it is. And God, forgive us when we get so focused on the behavior and the actions and the wrong done to us. And we don't even bother to think about the heart behind it. God, I think so many of us are just trying to put Band-Aids on Band-Aids on Band-Aids in our families. We're, we're not going anywhere with our family because we're, we're not dealing with the heart. And God, we know it all comes from the heart. So God, I pray that you would give each of us the strength and the courage to guard our hearts, to be committed to that, to make sure that nothing corrupt enters our hearts and that we surrender to you and your spirit to change our hearts from the inside out. That as our hearts change, it will inspire and impact our whole family. God, we thank you for Jesus and for going against the religious flow of his day to remind us of what really matters. God, we thank you for Jesus and his, his life and his death and his resurrection. And it's in his name we pray this. Amen. Well, we want to give you just a few moments to reflect 
on everything that's happened today, from the songs we've sung to looking into his word about our families and our hearts. We're just going to give you a couple minutes to do a couple things. We want to give you a couple things. Maybe you need prayer this morning. There's something heavy weighing on your heart. And we, 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 we want to weep with you. And so uh, here against this wall, one of our prayer team members is going to be up, up against the wall, and they'd love to pray for you during this time or after service. We also, as a, as a church, we, we celebrate every week the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross that gives us all hope. Messy, imperfect people. And so if you didn't, on your way in, there's a black table back in the back. Um, you can, in just a few seconds, if you didn't, you can go back there, uh, pick up one of the communion packets. There's two layers to it. The top layer is a cracker, and you can partake of that as, as you feel led, and that represents the body of Jesus that was broken on the cross. And then that second layer, you peel back, and that's grape juice, and it represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross that gives us life and gives us hope. Uh, maybe you just need to stay seated and let God's spirit speak to your spirit. Maybe you just need to start asking yourself those three questions and committing to, you know, I'm guarding my heart. I've, I've been a little sloppy with my heart lately and I need to be more stingy when it comes to what comes into my heart. Maybe you need to start wrestling with that and what that looks like for your family. So as God and his spirit leads you, feel free to do one of those things in the next few moments. God, we thank you for your loving grace for us that meets us right where we're at in life. And you love us so much that you will just meet us in our pain and our hurt and our confusion. But you love us too much to let us stay there. And so you stretch us and challenge us. So to, today, God, may we be changed, not by our own work and effort, by surrendering to you and to your spirit. And may that change our families. And God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church and worship you and celebrate you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for, having, uh, for being with us today, whether you're here in person or online. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy the beautiful weather. See you next week.